Hello, Tech fans, and welcome into episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, originating from TSL's High Tech Studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. On today's episode, we dedicate the majority of the show to Virginia Tech men's basketball. Does Saturday's upset of number three Villanova mean this is a top 25 team? and a squad that can make the NCAA tournament. Episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast gets started right now. Whether you are watching live or archived on YouTube, listening on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or on Stitcher, we are so glad that you could join us as we record on Monday morning, November 30th. We have our managing editor, Chris Coleman, with us on the show today, as well as our founder and general manager, Will Stewart, the best podcast producer in the land, Malcolm Stewart, behind the scenes. And I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes. A reminder, if you are watching on YouTube this morning, if you have a question for Will and Chris, we will get to it at the end of the show. Be sure to put it in the YouTube live chat. And also, if you're watching live on YouTube, please hit the like and subscribe button. This week and every week, the Tech Sideline Podcast is presented by the Fisher Law Firm, Virginia's trusted DUI and traffic defense firm, dedicated to defending individuals charged with traffic-related offenses. The Fisher Law Firm handles cases throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. To date, the firm has defended tens of thousands of people charged with moving violations. For free consultation, call anytime, day or evening, toll-free. The number is 1-800-680-7031. Again, that's 1-800-680-7031. Or you can email the Fisher Law Firm at info at fisherlegal.com. Gentlemen, good morning. It's great to be back with you. Will Stewart, how was your Thanksgiving? It was good. I'm, I'm, I was so excited because Virginia Tech did not have a game. That is the first time in, I don't know, I didn't even do the research. I don't remember the last time they didn't have a game. I, I don't think they've had a Thanksgiving weekend off since I started Hokie Central almost 25 years ago. So it was nice to be just hang out, eat dinner, help decorate the house for Christmas, all that stuff. It made me kind of lazy, made me not want to come back. <laughs> Chris, how was your Thanksgiving? Because typically I know you're working a lot of those games too. So did you get a chance to kind of kick back and relax? I did pretty much nothing all weekend. It was great. I didn't really realize nice. how tired I was. I, I, I know. slept a lot. Yep. And yep. I'm still tired. <laughs> but better better than now than it was, for sure. You know, a lot has happened in the last week. Think about it. It's been seven days since our last podcast. Of course, we didn't have a show on Thursday of last week because it was Thanksgiving. The last show that we had, we were breaking down the 47-14 win for Pittsburgh over Virginia Tech. And now we finally get to dedicate the majority of a show to Virginia Tech, Ben's basketball. And my goodness, what a start for Mike Young's squad. The Hokies are 3-0, and coming off of a upset win of number three Villanova on Saturday and then knocking off South Florida on Sunday. Will, how impressed have you been with this squad a week into the season? So I'm glad you asked a general question because to me, and I'm interested in getting Chris's thoughts about this because we haven't really talked about it, they just look completely different to me. And we'll go over some stats later that point out that that some things are very different with this team. But just, you know, they, they've they've typically moved the ball well on offense, but just the – the looks they're getting in the paint, the ease with which they are scoring, you know, somebody pointed out that towards the end of last year it was it was throw it around and then have somebody jack up a contested three. Now, you know, we're only three games in, and once the film gets out, we'll have to see how ACC coaches deal with Virginia Tech. But three games in, it, it looks like a much smoother operation, and you can see the depth of the lineup and how that's helping – how having post players is helping. And Chris had a comment about the Michigan State win last year versus the Villanova win this year. Which, uh, yeah, I thought last year when Tech beat Michigan State, it was luck to a certain extent. I mean, 
Nolly just got hot and made some insane shots that he couldn't replicate. Oh, I, I remember season. the three pointer that he clinched it with. He just right. threw it in from the ocean. Um, you, you didn't feel like Tech beating Villanova was luck. Uh, Villanova's a really, really good team, uh, but Tech went toe to toe with them. Um, they scored inside. They scored outside. They competed with them very well on the boards. Uh, you, you just felt like Tech belonged in that game, and it wasn't a fluke. Uh, that was my Tech way from watching it. I, I think there's more size, obviously. There's such a variety of players that you can lose, use different lineups depending on the, the matchup that you're facing. Like USF was a bigger team, right, and they're going to crash the boards. So you're wondering why Penzel didn't play very much the first two games. Well, he wasn't a great matchup against Villanova where they spaced the floor so much. But USF is a bigger team, so you go bigger to combat that and to keep them from crashing the boards and everything like that. Or, you, you know, you, you can go a little bit smaller with uh, against Villanova because, like I said, they basically run they're that ISO offense basically is what, is what it is to a certain extent. And you can go a little smaller against them. By having so many scholarship players, you give yourself more lineup options. And even when you're missing a couple of guys with injury, you've still got nine guys you you, you can put in the game. I mean, that, they're doing all this without John Ojiaco and, right. and Jalen Cohn, you know, right. guys who started a lot of games last right. year. So you, when you have 13 scholarship players, you could have two guys hurt and then one or two guys who aren't quite ready yet like Darius Maddox and, and even Gaston to a certain extent, and you still have nine guys, Yeah. right? Um, so it's, it's just a much, much deeper team. It's a more experienced team, you know, even though Pimsels has never played in the system, Jada has never played in the system, Mutz has never played in this system. You've still got experienced college basketball players now. And uh, you've got guys like Wabisa Beatty, who was played in a Sweet 16. You've got... Jada, who has played in Elite Eight with Kansas State. You've got Aluma, who's made the second round and played against Kentucky in the NCAA tournament at Wofford. I mean, you have experienced basketball players who have played in big games on this team. So, uh, just just a much, much better team, much stronger team than last year with, with more options. Uh, player development has been good, in my opinion. You, you, you've seen guys add to their games. So like, like Hunter Couture now has the ability to do something besides shoot a three-pointer, right? Which he still does well. <laughs> right, which he still does well. Um, Aluma, I think he attempted one three-pointer in his two years at Wofford, and this year he's shooting 66.7% from three-pointer. Yeah, range. I, don't, I don't have season stats there. don't have the individual there. stats on here. but uh, Well, you know, when you look at uh, Tyrese, <laughs> Tyrese Radford, one of 12 from three-point range last year, and he's, and he's already made two He's already year, made two. In, in um, I think, four or five attempts. I think Mutz made two three-pointers at, at Delaware, Delaware uh -huh. and I think he's already made two or three this year. So mm -hmm. you, you just see guys developing, in, in my opinion, and uh, that's a good sign. So you got roster depth. You know, you got a lot of different lineup options, and you've got a good, apparently, what is a very good player development system at, at Virginia Tech. So yeah. things are looking up for sure. We're going to break down the Villanova game in just a minute. That's what everybody wants to talk about. But we did not get a chance to preview the team before the season started. So, Will, I want to ask you this question. What were you expecting with this team coming in to year two of Mike Young as the head coach of the Hokies? Wow, that's a that's a darn good question. Um, in, in order to expect something, I would have had to kind of dedicate some mental energy to it. And with everything that's been going on with football, I will bluntly tell you, I was not thinking about basketball. You know, um, I, I I knew in one sense that having a full lineup would be a good thing. I felt like Kevin Aluma would be a good player. Uh, yeah, I didn't think he'd you be know, this good. So far, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's better than I expected. Um, I did not expect to see Tyrese Radford adding the three-point shot like that. Um, you know, as, as far as what Bisa Beattie goes, he's shooting better. And I've had a couple guys text me and say, you know, he looks better. Um, his percentage is up. I, I, I don't know that I see him being a lot different, though. But uh, I, I, I really didn't have a whole lot of expectations. That, but the, the biggest surprise to me is just how good they look this early for this group of players to be playing together. Now, I thought they looked rough against Radford. So I'm sitting there watching. I'm going, is, is, does, does Radford actually have some talent or what's going on here? Because Tech really doesn't look all that great. But, but you know, up in Connecticut in the two games over the weekend, I thought Tech looked really good. Well, you know, they didn't get their two 
preseason exhibition games this year that yeah. every team has normally. So Radford, to a certain extent, was an exhibition game. Um, I, I think they, they looked – a little more gelled offensively at an earlier stage than I than I would ex- have expected them to, with so many new faces and guys getting used to playing with each other. So that that's what I would say. That's probably what surprised me. I, I didn't really know what to expect, and I said this in, in the little season preview that I wrote. I thought they were going to be better, but the schedule's tougher too, right? Um, Tech plays a much harder ACC schedule this season than they did a year ago on paper. Now, we don't know what's going to happen on a week-to-week basis with COVID and contact tracing and all that as far as Virginia Tech goes and as far as their opponents go either. Um, No way to know. But my expectation was to be better. I thought this team was going to be a better team this year. I didn't know if it would show up in the win-loss record record because the ACC schedule is tougher this year than than it was a, a year ago. And obviously there's not as many games this year is or is there were a year ago either chris how different does mike young's offense look last year to this year when you have a post player like a luma that can step out and shoot it would be interesting like uh to ask him maybe i'll do this one day this year like what what percentage of his offense was installed last year um he was, but because it was, just, it was rough. It was rough in well, retrospect. Well, it was I mean, rough. when you when you're throwing the ball to a six five center, I mean, yeah. there's so much he wants to do that you just can't do when your center's six five. And right? he flat said in in one of his post game comments, he was talking about his post players, and I believe the phrase he used was, "This is the way I like to play." Mm-hmm. You know, with, with multiple guys inside, not. You know, multiple guys with size, and he had he had zero guys with size yeah, last he, year. He re- was, really, he had Ogiaco. Ogiaco coming off the bench for ten or twelve minutes a game, and right. then, and that was it. So I I don't know exactly how much was installed last year, but I don't and I don't know how much is installed now, but quite a bit more than last year. Mike Young's offense is sort of like think of, think of like an RPO for for football, a, a three read RPO or a three option RPO where a quarterback can either hand it off to the tailback, keep it himself, or hit that slanting wide receiver over the middle. So Mike Young's offense is sort of like that in a basketball term. There, there, are, so, there are multiple options on a play depending on how the defense plays you. And it takes a quite a while to learn that and install all of it, all the pieces of that, and then have your players – you know, be able to go out there and execute it without thinking. And Tech still isn't there. And how could they be there? Right. There, 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 there's so many guys on this team, like Jada is in his first year at Tech, experienced college basketball player, but this is a different system. And, and for you him. can tell that he's not as comfortable as Beattie is. I think the offense runs better with Beattie, whereas Jada is more likely to be able to get his own shot. Right. Um, I, I, I agree uh, that, that everything just – he just doesn't look as comfortable as Beatty right now. That doesn't mean he won't look as comfortable in January or February or, or whenever. Um, yeah, so I, I'd, I'd be interested to know exactly what percentage of the offense was installed last year and how that compares to this year. But, yeah, the Mike Young offense is not easy to learn, not easy at all. So, and even last year, it was new for everybody. Like, Wabisa Beatty was a very experienced player, right, learning a – but he was learning a brand-new system. So it was, it's a miracle Tech won 16 and 16 last year. Well, you know, I think you it, it just points out, you know, how good of a coach Mike Young is. And so we have we have a poster on the basketball board, uh, GC Hokey 34, who is a former college basketball assistant coach. And he actually uh, was on the Tech staff for a while. Uh, he was not a full-blown assistant, right? Chris? Right, right, right. But he was on – Greenberg staff to uh, for uh, for a couple of years I think so he's had he 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 uh, dropped by the board last night and and I think he got excited by what he was seeing and, and he put a long post on the board and something that he said that that I've I've read him say this before so I was looking at the roster and and, and trying to get more familiar with the roster because again I haven't wrapped my head around it yet and I'm looking and I'm thinking oh, Beattie's, Beattie's already graduated. Jada's already graduated. Or is this the last year for both of them? What's Tech going to do a point guard next year? So I'm like, oh, man. And then You're I'm right. telling myself, hey, just live in the moment. And then GC Hokie 34 reminds us of something that he has said before. The Mike Young offense isn't really point guard dependent. The way they move the ball and the way they run the offense, 
I think his I think GC Oka's thirty four phrasing is everybody's a point guard. Yeah, and I've I think the way I've described it before is the system itself is the point guard. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they'll 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 come across the court and throw the ball immediately. It's not like the point guard's going to hog the ball like he does in in some, you know, more uh, conventional conventional I would say. You know, and and particularly by the end of last year, teams had figured Tech out. They they knew Tech just wasn't good in the in the post. And, uh, you know, Nolly started to struggle down the stretch and, and and Tech just got really easy to defend. And again, just without, we'll dig into some stats, but just Tech just looks so much more fluid on offense and they're getting more good shots. So we are one week into the season. And I would have asked this question if we had done a basketball preview podcast. So I'm going to ask it right now before we get in to talking about the Villanova game, the USF game. Will Stewart, one week into the season, is this an NCAA tournament team, yes or no? If you had to predict right now on November 30th, what say you? I am gun-shy because they looked so good at the beginning of last year. And at one point, I think they were 14 and 5 and 5 and 3 in the ACC. And even at that point, they'd absorbed a couple of blowout losses. Well, after they beat Michigan State last year, they had two more games left in Maui. And got trounced in both. That's of them. right, BYU and, and Dayton. 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 Obi Toppin. Turns out that guy for Dayton was pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> they were going to be a number one seed if the NCAA tournament. Happened. But 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 those two games were, they sort of reinforced the fact that the the Michigan State game there was, was a kind bit of luck fluky. involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let's get back on track. What what was the question? Are they an NCAA tournament team? Um, man, this is such a crazy year. If it was a normal year, I would say they have a shot. And one of the things that that bothers me is I think this team, really any team, could really benefit from a full Castle Coliseum and a good atmosphere because they've done the same thing they did last year. They've had a big win early in the year. The fan base is noticing and is behind them. And I just think that, that if, if they could play in Castle and play in front of the Castle Guard and all the fans, that that would give them the juice they need at home. Mm-hmm. And I, so I don't know, and we don't know how many games are going to be. We don't even know if the NCAA tournament is going to happen. <laughs> now, what a disaster well, that would be for the NCAA. Well, well what's going to happen? I was actually thinking about this yesterday. They're going to have it in Indianapolis, right? Aren't they, Bubble. Aren't they so, talking so like, about it? Take so like everybody. 68 teams or how many are in the tournament and bring them all to Indianapolis. Well, okay, so what if like... What if you have dudes start testing positive and then you have to shut down a program? Do they have to forfeit their game? Because you can't wait a week to play a first round game, it's, right? Yeah. So it's um. Uh, so I think once you get to the NCAA tournament, if you can't play, you're 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 done. You 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 wrap it up and you go home, right? I, I'm I I'm guess. just I'm just I gonna know. I'm just gonna pump the brakes and say, I can see it. I can see how it would happen. But um, remember, as, as as we just talked about a minute ago, this team is as as better as they look, is still learning this offense. And and as ACC coaches watch film, they'll pick out the weaknesses. And they'll be like, you know, this guy's not good with this part of the offense. When he gets the ball, do this. Let, let's let's say the NCAA tournament happens and Virginia Tech's able to play their full schedule and there is a tournament. Chris Coleman, I know it's early. I know it's a weekend. But what say you? Is this a team I, that can make the NCAA I tournament? I certainly think they have the opportunity. Um, I, I just – and Will's right, you know, ACC coaches are, are really good. I mean, even the worst ACC coaches are are good overall coaches, yeah. right? Uh, Brian Gregory last night at UC, uh, USF was a was a bad ACC coach. But and he's oh, a bad coach at USF, too, and I have more to say about well, that. Well, no, no, later. here's the thing. He's fourth in USF history in wins. I saw that graphic, but he only has like 50 wins. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I thought that was almost a typo. Where's I, Seth in there? Any idea? <laughs> probably I, first. Seth I don't is know. probably way up there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, uh, so this, is a, this is a league of good coaches, and, and they are – For the most part. They, they, they will find spots. You know, they'll find weaknesses and everything. When they found weaknesses last year, Mike Young had nothing to counter with because he didn't have enough players, he didn't have enough experience, he didn't have enough size, just didn't have as many lineup options. And he'll be able to counter pretty much anything. He'll be able to counter the counters better this year because he's just got so many more lineup options. Uh, and l- like I said, man, this guy has, th- this team has three upperclassmen with major NCAA tournament experience. Solid point. And so. I think there's a strong, strong chance that, that they are. Um, 
I don't know what gets you into the NSA tournament this year. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, we have no I idea. mean, I have no idea. I mean. So don't sweat strength of schedule I, I, because I, that's just not really a thing anymore. And once they're in ACC play, that'll take care of that'll itself. That'll take care of itself. Um, there's no RPI Those anymore. quadrant thank wins, God. right? That's exactly. The, uh, yeah. That's a quadrant one win. And there's not a lot of cupcake home games to dilute your strength of schedule. R- right, right. So it's. I, so, yeah, I, I don't know what gets you into the NSA tournament. I don't know what guidelines we're operating under in, in the in this season so i don't know i do think that they, they'll have an opportunity to to be there there will be ups and downs like like every basketball season peaks and valleys but i think this year there there won't be as many valleys as there were last year well if yeah. virginia tech were to make the ncaa tournament this year it would be four consecutive trips to the ncaa tournament <laughs> and true. i got i did get, i did get confirmation from uh damien south on that that the ncaa has come out and said that they're there's no 2020 NCAA tournament. So if you were going to make it, you can't say that you did. Mm-hmm. So that if Virginia Tech were to make it, that would be four in a row. Yeah. So anyways, found that as an interesting stat. Okay, let's transition and talk about the, the headliner. We're going to talk about this overtime win over number three Villanova for Virginia Tech on Saturday night. 81-73 the final. Watford transfer Keve Aluma dropped a career high. 22 points in the win. Chris? What impressed you most about what was a resilient come from behind win for the Hokies? Well, the resiliency. The resiliency. That's a good word. Yeah. yeah. 52, um, 52 to 40, and I'm thinking, well, here comes Villanova. Right. right. Uh, you know, Tech got off to a good start in that game. Yeah. And they were hanging right there with them. And then Villanova goes on that run to go up by, was it by 12? It was 52 to 40. Okay. And you're like, well, that was a good effort, but, you know, Villanova's, they're a really, really good team. Uh, so Tech was able to hang in there then. And I think they scored eight in a row to yeah. make it 52-48. Uh, that sounds about right. And they put a run on them. And, you know, they just took over the game down the stretch. And then even when that controversial call happened right before the end of uh, end of regulation, you're, like, Tech players, like, that game was over. Tech had won, right? And then all of a sudden Villanova's at the free throw line, yeah. tying the game to send it into in overtime. That can be... That can be demoralizing. De- demoralizing, deflating. Lots of I mean, D words. Lots, lots, of, lots of words like that. Um, but Tech just, they came out in overtime and hit Villanova in the mouth. You know, they threw the first punch. Some of that is due to, you know, that was Villanova's third game in four days. Right. Um, Villanova's very, very good, but they got a couple of guys that that don't really come off the floor very much. And, uh, you know, they, they were probably worn down to a certain extent. Um you know, but, and, and just like last year, I didn't think Michigan State played well last year. Gillespie played really well for Villanova, mm-hmm. and and really their other stars did not step up. Right. Uh, the first half in particular, Gillespie was awesome, <laughs> and everybody else did nothing. Gillespie's one who uh, basically plays almost 40 minutes a game for yeah. him. So when he was missing those free throws in the, in the that's second right, half, that's right. and – that was his third game in four days, and he hardly ever comes off the court. So I think I think that had a little bit something to do with it. But uh, but yeah, I think Tech's resolve and the fact that they, uh, whenever it seemed like seemed like things weren't going to end well for them, uh, they found a way to to fight back. That was the biggest thing that stood out. Yeah. So me. you get down fifty two to forty, and and you come back from that. And then you have that that stuff happen at the end of regulation, and you bounce back from that. And really, it was seventeen to nine in overtime. The, this has been. This has actually been a feature of tech basketball for two two ten years in a row now. You know, Buzz's teams on a number of occasions found themselves down by a number of points and, and would come back and things like that. And now, now Mike Young's teams are doing it. And what's the one constant? I'm gonna I'm gonna sabotage the show. Please here do to talk about something I thought about all weekend. <laughs> what's the one constant on both of those teams? The latter Buzz Williams era and the early. Well, all I can think is Wabi Sabidi. Exactly. Exactly. Wabi Sabidi takes so much crap from this fan base because he's not an advanced offensive player, and he's not. But the most important thing Mike Young did when he got here was retain Wabi Sabidi. Not because Landers. remember, he was in the transfer portal. He was in the portal. transfer portal. Yeah. Not, not Landers Nolly, who was the more talented player, but Landers Nolly is, is, wants to do what's best for Landers Nolly, not necessarily the team. Tech has to win in basketball and football in a certain way with buy-in, right? And all you have to do is look at Wabisa Beatty. You can look at that dude and tell he's bought in, right? That dude works his tail off. And we talk, we've talked all this year about how there's a leadership void in that football program over there. 
and there is not in the basketball program. And young players follow the older players, and the older players set examples for for the younger players. And I think that's been a big issue with football. And one of the reasons we've had been success, been able to stay successful under Mike Young so far is because we have there's complete buy-in over there because people listen to Beatty. I've I've seen that dude in Kroger, man. When he walks into Kroger with his teammates, he's always the first guy through the doors and everybody else is behind him. Uh, he is the most important player in this program. And you can't look at a box score and and see that. And you can't you can't even necessarily see it on television. But I, I think what's happened to the football team this year and some of the issues they're having and the lack of buy-in and, and the leadership void and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, when they get to Kroger, I, nobody's the leader. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, actually, for a few of them, I think they need to go to Kroger a little bit more yeah, and add some know. weight. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Beatty's like, to me, the, like the unsung hero because everybody looks at a box score. But I think what has happened to the football team this year should really in, reinforce – with all of us, how important leadership is and how important buy-in is. And well, Bisa Beattie is a big part of that uh, at Virginia Tech. I mean, just, just made a tremendous difference in this program. Well, if, if, if you remember last year, my criticism of Beattie, if you want to call it criticism, wasn't that his offensive game was limited. I, I said repeatedly that he needed to have more confidence right. in his offensive yep. game. Go to the hole and finish, you know, and – and we haven't really had a chance to see that this year because that's not really, in my opinion, required of him. You know, they've got Jada who can get to the rim, and and the offense is just running so much better. Tyrese Radford, mm. I mean, Tyrese Radford against. Let, let's jump to USF. We can come back to Villanova. Last night, Tyrese Radford is four or four in the first half against USF, and he came out in the second half like a man on a mission. So I'm I'm going to the hole, try to stop me. You know, so. That's great, and that gets into a stat I did want to highlight, and that is last year free throws made per game, 9.5. I mean, everybody knew Tech couldn't couldn't drive to the hole. And so far this year in three games, it's 14 free throws made per game. There's nothing on here about, let's see, uh, free throws attempted, 55 in three games. That is 18. Last year, 429 in like – 35 33 to 35 games they're barely taking over 10 a game and this year they're closer to 18 so one of their things going into this year was rebound the ball better and get to the rim more offensively and draw more fouls and that's so that's something they're doing better uh you know we got to let more games accumulate and see how it goes again in acc play but that's a promising early sign um, we're going to talk more about individual players a little bit later. I want to talk about some of the, the transfers that have come in. I want to talk more about Wabi Sabidi and as well as Tyrese Radford, who led the team in scoring in the win over South Florida. I want to go back to the Villanova game quickly, though, because that play at the end of regulation, we talked about it. The, the charge that was taken, Villanova, the two free throws, sends it in overtime. You come all the way back in the second half to tie it, take the lead, and then have that happen. I mean, just a gut punch. They, what, they said, what, was, so was this the one where they would say Kevin Illuma out there and said, miss the free throw? And he actually and the, banked and the it color in. announcer on ESPN, ESPNU, I think, is, is warning everybody, it is harder to miss than you would think. Yeah. And sure enough, Illuma, how many you're, times have you seen guys bank in free throws when they're trying to miss? You're trying to throw it right at the front of the rim, and if you get it a little bit high, boom, but if it it's goes dead in. on, it banks in. Can you imagine if we, if the reasoning that we had lost to Villanova was, would have been, was because of a missed free throw? Well, you mean a made free throw? Or excuse me, a made free a made throw. Free right, throw right. Yeah. Can you imagine like making a free throw costs you a game against Villanova? Oh, that would be goodness. one crazy headline, right? Yeah, um, it, but uh, so so the, the the color guy, I think it was the same color guy both John nights. Crispin. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I listened to Laser and Burnup because they, they were doing their live thing on Facebook and I sort of synced it up with my television for most of the Villanova game, but people on the boards were complaining about the announcers being pro Villanova. You know, I don't know what people expect. I don't know what they're I looking know, for. I thought, the I thought they were, they were, I thought they I thought were actually they were excellent. I, I know, thought they were right down know, the middle. It, but fans are like that. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, by, by the end of the USF game, he was singing Virginia Tech's praises. Oh, yeah. And he also, we'll get to the USF game later. Sorry. <laughs> no, well, we can transition to it. My point, I just wanted to take away from the Virginia Tech-Villanova game was just, this team has not played together long. 
You've got a bunch of new players on this team, and you're able to come back and rally against the number three team in the country that's won multiple national titles over the last decade, and then have that happen and outscore them 17-9 to nine in the overtime period with Wabisa Beatty fouling out. Right. I mean, to me, that feels like a signature moment for this team early in the year that they well, can go back and, and, and rely on. To me, it's a, it's a signature moment for the program. It's one thing to beat Michigan State when – you have a hot shooting day. Their star point guard's brother had just gotten killed. Yeah. Tom Izzo is Mr. March. He's not Mr. November. Yeah, right? they're known uh, for losing early yeah, in the year. Yeah, so that's one thing. I think pound for pound, Villanova is the best basketball program in the country, in, in my opinion. And uh, so so when you can beat them and you, can, you actually go head-to-head with them, Play for play. Weren't they there in Pittsburgh when Tech was there? And didn't oh, they yeah. didn't they play, play Radford? Radford? I watched yeah. them. I oh. watched now. Now it's Radford. It's their first NCAA tournament in a while. Mm-hmm. But I watched them stomp Radford, and I was just like, "Holy cow, this oh, team is good." There were the Radford players uh, on their way off the court. Uh, I was down in the front row, and I was in the tunnel when they came off the court after the game, and the Radford players were all laughing and smiling. It was like. Yeah, we never had a chance. We never had a chance. <laughs> we were playing Villanova, just happy to be here. So <laughs> you know? that, that reminds me of, I went to see when, when when Tech was in the Big East from like 99 through 2003, and Ricky Stokes was coaching. I went to see uh, uh, Notre Dame play Tech. And and Mike Bray was coaching Notre Dame at the time. He's been there a long time. And, and I remember a play where, um, you know, of course, Notre Dame stomped him. But I remember a play where Notre Dame came down with a defensive rebound and got a layup at the other end, and the ball never touched the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the mark of a of a well coached team is when they can move the ball ninety feet and it doesn't touch the floor. The, the the big thing that stood out to me in Villanova was actually at the end of the game when they get two point four seconds left, it's over. Jay Wright calls a timeout, and Buzz Williams used to do stuff like this, and that's why he was a great make coach opposing too. fans mad. <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he called a timeout. It was a teaching moment with a couple of his players. They had no chance to win. They were down by seven points, and they knew they had no chance to win. And his players go back out on the floor and, and they're clapping, right? Yeah. And that's the mark of a great program when you don't waste any any moments that you have to, to get better and things like that. Well, at and, this point, they're totally comfortable with who they are. Yeah, they're exactly. I mean, that, championships right. And that's why I say pound for pound, I think they're the best basketball program in the country. And here's your trivia. Virginia mm-hmm. Tech is now, I believe, 2-9 and nine all time against Villanova. Uh, Mike Young has one of those wins. Which Virginia Tech coach has the other? I believe Ricky Stokes. I believe has you it. are correct. I Rick, think they whipped Villanova. Although they, they hammered time. him. I remember yeah. Carlos Dixon had been out with a foot injury, of probably a fifth metatarsal, of course, right? And he comes back for that game, and I think he only scored three points, but it gave Tech a a boost, and they hammered Villanova. That I think that was like a senior day or something in Castle. And Villanova was ranked too, if I remember correctly. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and. And it was one of those special days where the coaches were wearing like a certain kind of shoes for, I don't know what they, that, you know, that game cancer. every year where they, yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe that was it. Maybe I forget, but uh, like, so Jay Wright's in there out there in his suit, but he's wearing like tennis shoes and I had like second row seats for it. So I remember the game vividly, but yeah, tech hammered him and Ricky Stokes team had a habit of, you know, well, they were always bad but that they'd go out and hammer UConn or hammer Villanova or hammer UVA. Yeah. And you were like, oh, where's this? Where's this? I mean, we've got the talent. <laughs> we're just not a good did, did, team. Rick, Ricky at some point had a lot of talent. The, la- the Actually, the last time we put a basketball team on the court that looked like this, that looked like the one we have right now was under Ricky Stokes, yep. where we actually had 13 scholarship players, four or five guys that could actually play in the post. Yeah, I mean, that was the last time we had a basketball team that looked like this. But the, Ricky just didn't didn't know what he to do with it. He just couldn't run a program. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jay Wright uh, certainly sung Coach Mike Young's praises after the game, and I, I don't want to allude to that. You mentioned how great of a program they are. You think they're maybe the best in the country. Jay Wright's won two national championships at Villanova. You pointed this out on Tech Sideline Twitter. Uh, Jay Wright tweeted after the game: "Congrats to at Coach M K Young and at Hokies M B B. A tough and intelligent team." We tip our caps, close quote, and then was singing their praises in the Philly Inquirer. So I, I just think about this game, by the way, which was scheduled um, less than 48 hours before it was played. This was not originally on schedule. And just the respect that both coaches had, I just thought that was a really unique moment. You don't see a lot of head coaches going on Twitter and, and, and congratulating the other team for uh, being intelligent. Oh, right, exactly. And the crazy thing is, have we even talked about this yet, that this game was not originally supposed to be played. That's right. Tech was supposed to play Temple, Temple. on Saturday. 
and they find out at 1.45 in the morning is when they come to the agreement to play Villanova. 1.45 in the morning on Saturday? Friday, I think. Friday. Thanksgiving okay. night slash Friday okay. morning. Okay, okay, right. I think is what it was. So they basically had a day to prepare. So it was like, a, it was like an NCAA tournament game from, from that standpoint. So so here's a couple of things I tweeted out, that, you know, in case you're not on Twitter, in case you missed them. So um, Villanova led 52 to 40 with 848 left in regulation and seemed to be in control. So Tech, uh, that 848 plus five minutes of overtime outscored Villanova 41 to 21 down the stretch and so so let's play this will be a fun reminiscing moment to sidetrack things here so the stat was that in their last six games against top three teams virginia tech is four and two Mm -hmm. not top five teams not top 10 teams but top three teams virginia tech is four and two michigan state was number three so i looked them up and i put them in order the and and this started when virginia tech went to uva in the 2017 2018 season February of 2018, that was the night that UVA was number two and number one had lost, and all UVA had to do was beat Tech, and they would get the number one ranking. Mm. And Tech went in there and beat the Who's uh, 61-60. I believe that was in overtime. Blackshear mm-hmm. late shot. Yeah. UVA had stomped Tech earlier that year. Yes. Stomped them. Yeah, and, and UVA, UVA shot uncharacteristically poor from three-point range that night. They were four of 25. I remember that. But there were some clutch shots like Nikhil Alexander Walker made a long three pointer. Just a just a great game by Virginia Tech. And so the next one is a year later in February of twenty nineteen, Tech lost to number three UVA sixty four fifty eight. I don't remember anything about that game. Um twenty what year what year was it? Twenty nine February twenty nineteen. Oh, that was uh that was when Jerry Rob was hurt. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And then eight days later, Tech played against number three Duke, and that was when Zion was out. Yeah, and Zion was the Zion cam was on him, uh-huh. and Justin Robinson was also out, but nobody talked about Justin <laughs> Robinson being out. And Tech won seventy seven seventy two. That's right. Um, so the next one was uh, about a month later. Of course, Tech played number one Duke in the Sweet Sixteen and lost seventy five seventy three when uh, Med Hill short armed he, he alligator armed that last shot. And then, of course, uh, the last two games and wins are number three Michigan State last year, 71-66, and number three Villanova this year, 81-73. So one of my one of my projects at some point is um, Seth. I, I remember this stat: Seth Greenberg was three and three against number one teams at Tech, and it should have been four and two, except Sean Dockery made that long shot. That's right. You know, and and if you look through Tech basketball history, they have this remarkable history of playing well against highly ranked teams. If I'm not, I don't pay enough attention to other college basketball teams, but you got to figure big college basketball fans, when they see that go across the bottom these days, they're like, man, Virginia Tech did it again. You know, so just wanted to kind of go over those games because that stat came out, but nobody put it together and said, here they are. So after beating number three Villanova, you're playing in uh, less than 24 hours against uh, South Florida and Many thought maybe this could be a trap game. You know, you're playing on back-to-back days. Don't know what could quite happen, and certainly that did not happen. 76-58, the final. I don't want to spend too much time here, but I want to talk about Tyrese Radford. You brought him up, Will. Chris um, led the team in scoring with 21 points. Kev Aluma with 12 points. And then uh, Cordell Pemsel really kind of made a name for himself with 10 points off the bench and six rebounds. He's going to be a matchup guy. Um, depend, you know, he's going to play more in some games depending on matchups. Like he'll play a lot against Florida State, right. for example, right? Um, he comes from the Big Ten, which is a very, very physical league. And, and Mike Young alluded to this after the game. He said, you know, with the biggest South Florida is, you know, you like a big guy with, with, with Big Ten experience and to just come in and who can who can bang with those dudes on the inside. And Pimsel's able to do that. You know, he's got – He's got some toughness to him. He's got some uh, some grit, so to speak. <laughs> I'll say. I'm not wearing my grit face. Mask, uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but yeah, he's gonna he's gonna be one of those players. You don't want to play him a lot against Villanova, which is gonna run a four out ISO offense and 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 put defensive players in space, right? Well, USF doesn't do that, so you can play him more. Um, don't expect fireworks from him every night because he's not gonna get a large number of minutes every night. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be matchup dependent. But, yes, for his role, 
on this team, he plays it very well for sure. Uh, so I was thinking a thought I had, and, and, and it relates to big men. Um, do you remember the Kerry Blackshear foul watch? How every game was just fraught with anxiety over how many fouls Kerry Blackshear oh, yeah. had. What what point was he going to pick up a second foul? You know, yeah. and 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 you went in a panic mode if it was his second foul with ten minutes to go. Oh in the my first gosh, half. yeah, because his backup was six five. You know, and, and now um, I'm not I'm not saying I'm going to worry about Kevin Aluma being on the floor or not being on the floor. But it's not a damn disaster if, <laughs> exactly. if, if one of Tech's big men <laughs> has a little foul trouble and has to sit down. And, and so the unknown here is how has Ojiako developed, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in Mike Young's system? Do we know anything about Ojiako's injury that's keeping him out? I think Mike Young said it was a hamstring. I think Jake wrote, wrote in the recap last night that mm -hmm. – it was knee, but I, I thought Mike Young had said earlier that it was hamstring, so I kind of took the knee part out and just put injury. <laughs> well, so uh, so no, no big I don't hurry. think it's a big – I don't think it's a big injury or anything. And, oh, by the way, Jalen Cohn will be back for Thursday's game against VMI. Yeah, and, yeah, that's right. And, and that's another one who is going to – Cohn is going to be a matchup-dependent player. Yeah. Um, but it, the more options you have, the better. So it already kind of felt like watching the two games this weekend, I kept saying to myself, my goodness, Tech just – Feels like they've got so many guys they can bring off the bench, and then you're thinking, wait a minute, Ojiako hasn't played, Cone mm -hmm. hasn't played, so he's got options on options on options this year, Coach Young. So, and I yeah. don't remember which game it was, but Couture just basically rode the bench almost the entire game. Was it the Villanova game? Well, he, he started, I believe, and then the second quarter, the second half, he did not play. Didn't play as much in the second yeah. half uh, against Villanova. Yeah, right. and then he came in, and, and and I actually tweeted out. You know, uh, Hunter Couture comes in ice cold and makes two free throws. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not an easy thing to right. do. Only played 13 minutes against Villanova, but he started. Yeah. So, and then how many did he play last night? And then against South Florida, he played a total of 20 minutes, right. but came off the bench and scored 13. So, right. and and I think another player, by the way, uh, that had a good weekend uh, was uh, Naheem Aline. I yeah, mean, against I uh, so. Villanova, a, a quiet 20 against the Wildcats. He's a good player. Um, very good player, I think. With a lot, he might be like out of everybody on this team, he's probably the most likely to go out and score twenty in any given night, in my opinion. Would be Naheem Aline. Like he's added a little bit to his game. He he feels a little bit better about the mid range shots and, and everything. I think that's accurate. I, the mid range stuff is good. But again, it's like this seems to be a really good player development staff. I mean, look at the number of players whose whose games have improved since last season i know it's a it's a small sample size yeah like for like for example aluma's not going to shoot 66.7 percent from three-point range all year right? right if he does then the answer to your earlier question about yes, they're going to the NCAA yes they're going to go to the ncaa <laughs> tournament um very very pleased though with what we've seen so far and but like you shouldn't dial in like oh a start this is going to be the starting five into your head because i think it's going to vary like we've we've three games three different starting lineups uh, Mike Young, you know, he didn't get two exhibition games to learn a whole lot about his team, and and he's got so many options that he can afford to sit back and and play matchups and and things like that. So it's going to vary based on the opposition, but uh, I will say that you know it's going to be really tough to take Tyrese Radford out of that starting lineup. It's going to be really tough to take Beatty, uh, Beatty and Aluma uh, out of the lineup. So those three are going to think right, um, but but those other two spots. Uh, you know, the, and, and maybe even Beatty's to a certain extent. Um, Beatty has to play a certain amount of minutes because of his leadership role on the maybe. team. That, 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 that's, that's just the fact of the matter. But, you know, there might be some matchups where Jada is a better, better matchup against a specific team or whatever. But honestly, I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to sweat the small things this year. Like uh, I'm starting. Yeah, I'm just, just going to enjoy it. Yeah. All right, we're about halfway through the podcast. That means we need to step aside for a break. It's time for some elevator music on episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. When we come back, we take a look at a couple of new pieces on the roster, what's ahead for men's basketball, the schedule, and then we get to your questions on YouTube Live. This is episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. Welcome back into episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast as we record on Monday morning, November 30th. It's great to have you with us. He's Chris Coleman. We've got Will Stewart, Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes, and I'm Evan Hughes. 
Tech Sideline Podcast presented by Campus Emporium. We have a featured item oh, on goodness, the podcast yes. set <clears throat> today is Will reaches over his chair and holds up something that would be great to wear in Blacksburg right now because it's yeah. pouring down rain as we record. Will and, disc- and it is starting to get cold. Yeah. It's supposed so, to be like 34 tomorrow. So the official name of this is a fleece-lined enterprise jacket by Charles River, seventy-four ninety-nine. I am not wearing it because it's 75 degrees in the office, and I would just roast if I put this thing on. But it's very comfy, very nice. I actually do want to put it on. <laughs> I'm not going to put um, Now, this is not quite on the site yet because Thanksgiving. So I will put it in, in the links on the site. We'll drop the link in the uh, YouTube uh, description of the YouTube video. But it's a very, this is a very nice piece of gear for only seventy four ninety nine. If you had something like this from um, uh, Nike or Under Armour, you'd probably be looking at over a hundred bucks or something like that. But this thing is really sweet. Just that's my detailed description of it. It's really sweet, it's really sweet. <laughs> and I can't wait to wear it. So two winter sports are off to great starts: Virginia Tech men's basketball and Virginia Tech women's basketball. And one winter sport that should have a great season this year is Virginia Tech wrestling. Wrestling. Southeast Regional Training Center, proud partner here of uh, Tech Sideline, Tech Sideline Podcast. Go to southeastrtc.com to find out how you can help Virginia Tech wrestling today. So right. can I jump in here and go over some stats? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I printed out. A uh, comparison of uh, last year's basketball stats versus this year's. Now, this year's is through only three games. Caveat. Um, so, so far this year, 78 points a game versus 68.6 last year. Um, but I'm sure Tech was doing well early in the year last year, too, and then ACC play started. Uh, field goal percentage so far for the Hokies is 49.7%, close to 50%. Last year, they ended the year at 41.9%. They They – they struggled to make shots later in the year, and they and they wound up at 42%, basically. Three-point shots are 41.9% versus 35.2 last year. And, you know, last year they were they were such a perimeter-oriented team, you know. And I remember Nolly got so cold the yeah, second half of the season. And that really and That guy would shoot 10 three-pointers a game and miss nine of them. And yeah. yeah it's going to yeah, hurt so, your percentage. So I think early in the year, they were probably also shooting well um, um, from three. So I already gave free throws made per game was 14 this year versus nine and a half last year. Um, rebounding margin is plus two in three games. And didn't Radford out rebound tech? Um, Evan, can you look that up while I, while I run down? Last year, they were minus 3.3. And here's a stat from last year. Let me uh, – pull this chart out and make sure that I count this right. This one I've got in my head. In the last 19 games last year, Tech out-rebounded two teams. <laughs> and they re- out-rebounded them by one rebound and two rebounds. Radford right. out-rebounded Tech by one rebound, 23-22. Yeah, yeah. So looking down the last few games last year, these are rebounding deficits. Miami minus 10, Duke minus 18, Virginia minus 11, Louisville minus 14, Clemson plus two, (laughs) Notre Dame minus 17, North Carolina minus 15. Tech was getting stomped on the boards at the end of last year. And as a matter of fact, in however many games they played, it was 30-some, maybe 35. They only out-rebounded their opponents about eight times. So it, and, and as I said down the stretch, it was very rare. So that's something to keep an eye on is is uh, rebounding, which yeah, which is that's not going to happen this year. Yeah, it's not. Um, so turnovers per game, their turnovers are up this year, eleven point seven so far versus nine point nine last year, um, and the assist to turnover ratio, which was one point five last year, is one point two this year. You know, so it's it's still solid, but not quite as good. Well, you know, it's going to be. The bad part about having an extra big man on the court is that's one fewer ball handler, right? So when when you when you're trotting out four guards and a six five center, you're going to be really good at passing and handling the ball, of course. So you say your turnovers are going to be down to a certain extent just because of the type of personnel you have on the court. When Tech is playing more traditional, like this year, their turnovers will be up a little bit because it's one fewer ball handler slash passer on the court. And, you know, if you pass around the perimeter a lot and then jack up a three-pointer, you haven't yeah. turned it over, but yeah. it's a terrible possession. Yeah, it's it's like, oh, this team doesn't throw any, any interceptions. Well, they only throw it 
11 times a game. Right? <laughs> so so here's a here's an interesting stat that if, if you go and you look at the season stats for the team, you don't see this statistic. It's points in the paint. And so since Tech has only played three games, I looked it up. They outscored Radford 20 to 18 points in the paint. Villanova 32 to 22. Nice. USF 42 to 24. So this year Tech has outscored their opponents in the paint 94 to 64. That's a big stat. Um, to get it for, I, I drilled down through some of last year's stats and, and I couldn't find it explicitly, so I'd have to go through the actual game recaps to total all that up. And that's a big project, so I couldn't do it in preparing for this. I think maybe this. I'll do my inside the numbers on basketball this week. Hmm. I mean, do you really want to read any more numbers about the football team? I don't think I want to write any more. Uh, well, and plus Tech didn't play a game. Well, you skipped last week. I skipped inside. last week, but I don't – one of the reasons I skipped last week is I didn't know what to write about. It was 47-14. Yeah. <laughs> that's all the numbers you need to know. Yeah, really, there's one number. It's the one on the scoreboard. So, anyway, I just wanted to run those down. No, I absolutely love the stats. I think that's one of the things that makes our podcast so great are the in-depth numbers that we get. I wish there was a pro football focus, uh, pro football or pro college pro basketball. basketball focus. Is there any actually, way to well, get up? Yeah, actually, uh, I need to go ahead and do my yearly subscription to Ken Palm. And he has a lot of advanced stats. Yeah. So, there are a couple of players I want to mention before we get to questions. I'm going to go rapid fire with you guys. Initial thoughts, spend maybe 60 seconds on these players. Just – Rapid fire on Virginia Tech players that might be new to the team this year or a couple of guys that are coming back that uh, have impressed you early this season so far. So we've talked about him a little bit. We want to talk about Cartier Jada, the grad transfer from Kansas State. 30 seconds, Chris Coleman. What do you like about Jada? What does he bring to the table? Looks like a good athlete who can get his own shot. Uh, but again, like I think he'll improve within the offense throughout the course of the season. The biggest question is how good of a shooter is he? You know, went from like around forty percent his freshman year at Kansas State to like twenty six or seven percent last year. You mean from outside the arc? From the outside the okay. arc, yeah. So how good of a shooter is he from the outside? We don't know yet. The only he's only attempted a couple and he's missed both of them. Um, he'll be a good player. How good depends on how quickly he adapts to the offense and how good of an sh outside shooter he is. He does not look comfortable in the offense yet. Right. But um, he is an experienced college player, so that's why he's getting a, a fair number of minutes right now. Transfer from Delaware, Justin Mutz of Ford. Will, what do you like about him? I, I do not have a feel for Mutz versus Pencil yet. Um, I, it's early enough in the season that, you know, Aluma's standing out, but – I'm not separating separating out Mutz and Pencil yet, so I can't really. Hasn't he hit a few three pointers? He hit a couple threes that that I didn't necessarily expect because he wasn't yeah. making them at Delaware. Yeah, um, he's been a good rebounder so far. I think he had nine last he night. He had nine last night. Yeah, uh, and, so he's one of those guys. He doesn't seem doesn't seem like he's going to be like a ten point a game every night for Virginia Tech. Like I thought, I thought he was good offensively against Villanova and not so good last night, although he did have a couple of nice passes. Uh, but he's a guy who's steadily moved up levels from High Point to Delaware and now ACC. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he's still – he, he it's not like he's gone out there and, you know, played a Villanova every game of his career. Does – well, everybody has another year if they want it. Yeah, um, yeah. Is he's he, a redshirt junior. Okay. Uh, a couple of newcomers to the team, and I bring uh, correct pronunciations as well. I had Thank some you. fun making sure I had everything – Joe Bama Seal. Bama what do you, Seal. What do you like about him? Uh, I, I, he seems energetic. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, seems energetic on the bench. He was the guy that, that they kept putting the camera on during the Villanova game. Uh, he's pressing offensively. And when you're a freshman and you see everybody else in the court playing really well, which pretty much Virginia Tech is doing right yeah. now, then you want to get out there and press. You want to play really well, too. So he's trying to do too much and not playing within the offense right now. He's Once he figures out that out, he's going to be fine. He's, he's a talented player. Yeah, so so this is Mike Young's challenge. Uh, Bama Seal is, Seal is a um, – you know, he's a highly regarded guy. He's, mm -hmm. he's very athletic, and he's probably used to having a lot of success in high school at AAU level. Can, can, can you dial him back and get him comfortable in the system before mm -hmm. he gets frustrated? Now, you talk about he looks happy on the bench. That's good news because he is a guy, and this is what I, if I was Mike Young, I'd tell him this. We're not playing you a whole lot of minutes yet, but you have a really bright future in this program as you get more comfortable in the office. You know, GC Hokey 34, the way he put it was – a guy who can get a shot anytime he wants it in high school and AAU ball has to adjust to getting his shot within the system. 
another talented uh, guard that was a part of Mike Young's first recruiting class, Darius Maddox. I'm sure he's probably telling him some of the same things, right? Well, he's barely, oh, yeah, barely I mean, we've been seen on the him floor. for like two minutes yeah. uh, in the first game. So don't know a whole lot about him right now. But that's what I like about this program, man. The freshmen don't have to play a lot of minutes. I mean, you That'll could certainly you could, make Chris you, Coleman. You could redshirt <laughs> Darius Maddox if you wanted to, right? Uh, that's, I think that's the first time we've talked about redshirting today. That is it correct. T- it took us an hour too long. To talk we, about we've it. talked about you see see now you your your catchphrase is like buy in. You talk about buy in more than you talk about redshirt. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, last one in terms of newcomers, and here is the correct pronunciation: David Gasson. 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 I've gone from Gisan to Gesson to Gasson. So you can group him with Bamasil and Maddox. They're, none of them are playing a lot because they're new to the system and new to college ball. Yeah. Um, and and so if, if you look at, yes, Virginia Tech is playing a lot of guys. I think, I think nine or ten guys are averaging over ten minutes a game. But the young guys pretty much aren't. Mm-hmm. Gasson played just eight minutes against South Florida, and Bamasil played 12 minutes. Yeah. Right. And uh, – Gasson is he's a very skilled player. Uh, he's about six eight or six nine, and in the limited amount of time we've seen him against Radford and against USF, you've seen him dribble down the baseline and go go baseline and, and try to kick it back into a guy cutting down the lane. You don't you don't you don't see six eight six nine. I was going to say he's listed at six nine, right? Right. You don't see six nine guys driving down the baseline like that. He is a skilled player. All right. So. Uh, Put some uh, meat on him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm excited for him, but you know, it's it's just we don't have to we don't have to play him 20 or 30 minutes a game like the Hokies have had to do with so many freshmen yeah. over the years. You know, because there's quality depth on this team, you can take it easy with these guys. You don't have to you don't you don't have to speed up their development. You know, think about playing a freshman is if you play him too much and he doesn't play well, it could hurt his confidence and hurt his development. And that shouldn't be the case with these guys. They, they should be able to be brought along at, at the appropriate pace. See, if, if Bamasil, Bamasil throws down a thunderous dunk in Castle Coliseum and there's 250 people there to see it, that's going to be sad, man. I know. <laughs> uh, there's one more player I want to get to, but actually we have a question on YouTube Live about him, so I will save it for that. Okay. Last thing before we get to the questions, though. You look at the rest of this schedule for the 2020 slate before January 1st. This is the upcoming schedule for men's basketball. Virginia Military Institute, VMI on Thursday. Penn State, Clemson, Coppin State, Longwood, and Miami. Will, don't want to get too far ahead, and it's early, but is that a slate where you could see the Hokies run the table? Uh, You could. Who's who's the last one? Miami. 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 Miami's they, pretty loaded, they, aren't they? They should be good this year. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I I don't have my ACC preseason media poll uh, memorized. Um. And Long Longwood was playing somebody good yesterday or the day before, and kind of hanging in there with them. Longwood's not going to be okay. Uh, <laughs> um. They could, man. How many games is that? Five more. Six. That'd, that'd be. Should nine we talk about Penn State? Yeah, so I what's want to beat Penn State. State. Look, <laughs> Please, like, Chris, elaborate. Uh, people, Why? people were talking last night about, oh, well, are we going to make the NCAA tournament? And I, we, I know we've talked about it today, but I'm just sitting there looking at the schedule. And I'm like, I just want to beat Penn State. You know, the only team Virginia Tech has ever beaten in the ACC Big Ten Challenge is Iowa. It was 2017, right? <laughs> That's the only time Virginia Tech has ever won the ACC. That's Big right. That was an upset when, of that J. Rob. That, that, that they've so lost. We, they've lost to Penn State like. Two or three times in, in this event. State. Even even Tech's Sweet 16 team, the best team Tech has ever had, somehow managed to lose to Penn State. I might Hill scored zero points that night. I might Hill was a really, really Ridiculous. good player. So I just want to beat Penn State. Man. Well, wasn't there a game one year where Van Ziegern had like two rebounds the entire game, you know, and people were just roasting him for not playing well against Penn, Penn State. State. Yeah. And then, he, <laughs> and then he transferred to like, was it Northwestern? Northwestern. And came into Castle and beat Tech. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. Can we please just beat Penn State's basketball so, so, team? So this can year? we talk about the departed? Uh, Landers Nolly is at Memphis, and, and all, all three of these guys have immediate eligibility. Landers Nolly is at Memphis, where I haven't paid attention. I think he's playing. I think okay. he's playing well. He's starting, yeah. <clears throat> um, Isaiah Wilkins is at Wake Forest. I find it hard to believe that Isaiah Wilkins was not a good fit for this team. Um, 
I just I was I was always a big Wilkins fan. He's so smooth and has such good hands. Uh, but you know, he and Mike uh, Young had a nice conversation, and I think that was the story. You you don't really have a future. I, I, I forget the last piece. Do you, Evan, do you remember the last transfer Virginia Tech added? Was it Pemsel or was it somebody else? <clears throat> I do. I believe that. Jada was the first. Mm-hmm. I think that Pemsel was the was final. It, it was I think Pemsel or Mutz. Um, and honestly, it might have been. You know what? I think it was Mutz. So Mike Young wanted big guys. I mean. Yeah. You needed another big guy, and you got too many guards. And the third one is uh, P.J. Horn. You know, same same story. Uh, P- P.J. did the best he could last year with what he had. He was a good mm-hmm. three-point shooter early on, then wasn't later in the year. And, and he went to Georgia, and I haven't had a chance to check and, and see how he's doing. I, I, I don't know that I've even seen a Georgia score. I have no idea how Georgia uh, Honest scored. question, because we all know how talented of a player he is, but – does this team miss Landers not only do you think? No, 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 no. no, no. no. Uh, look, you have to – oh, yeah, well, we miss his talent for sure. I mean, Landers is a talented basketball player. But like I said earlier, Virginia Tech is a program in, in football and basketball that has to win in a certain way. And we, we need guys that are bought into the program, to the system. And uh, and I, I like Landers uh, fine. I, I'd never had an issue. I've been around him plenty of times after games, and he was Radford's roommate, and I and I like Tyrese Radford. So, but like Landers Nolly's long term view of himself playing basketball does not fit in with the long term vision of Virginia Tech basketball program, and that's fine. There's no reason for those two to remain married. If it if if you think it might become dysfunctional in one, and one of the parties not happier with the other, down the road, you know you don't want that to happen and, and affect team camaraderie. I mean, my gosh, if there's anything we've learned from the football program right now, it, it, it's it's not it, it shouldn't be about like we still want to talk about recruiting rankings and blah 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 and and the most important thing is buy-in and team chemistry, and, chemistry and everything yeah. like that and if and we, leadership and leadership and, and and things like that and if there's anything like if there's any i can't think of anything more contrasting right now in those aspects than the virginia tech football program the virginia tech basketball program quite frankly and, and specifically with respect to landers nolly i said multiple times last year that i would watch him on the bench and he was never sulking he was never by himself i thought he was always engaged even to the bitter end when things were going so yeah poorly. so i've got no issue with nolly but but like if you come to that fork in the road and and one of and the program wants to go this way and, and a player wants to go that way then they need to uh they need to part ways, part ways. so yeah i don't i'm not I don't, so yes i mean they miss his talent level i wish i wish virginia tech had a completely bought in to virginia tech landers nolly but if, if that's not the case then it's best that they hey, split he, he helped them win some games sure. last year absolutely yeah. did uh Thanks to David Cunningham texting me. Uh, Jada was March 31st. Pencil April 19th. And then Mutz committed June 15th. Mutz committed within a couple of weeks, I think, of of Wilkins announcing that he was leaving the program. Hmm. So maybe even within a week. So it was one of those things where I think Mutz was, uh, was ready to jump on board and, and Mike Young had to make room. Okay, so mm. all right, let's get uh, let's get into some uh, questions on YouTube Live. Thanks to everybody who stayed with us. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, so coming over from the first stream, the second stream, and re-asking some really good questions. I want to start with Matt Hart. He says, "With an NBA style positionless offense that Mike Young runs, do you see Virginia Tech landing some big time or possibly one and done recruits?" I. D- I would caution against it. Uh, yeah. I um, think that's what Duke's battling is, is too many superstars, guys that are one and done. Yeah. Uh, and look I, at Villanova, the way they do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't think that's the way to win at Virginia Tech. I also think it takes more than one year to learn Virginia Tech's Mike Young system. Yeah. So that I don't think – I would rather, rather have – three-star juniors and seniors and a five-star freshman who's going to be gone in one year because those three-star junior and seniors, they have learned the system. The, like they're going to be ma- operating to max efficiency, and I, I, j- I just don't see like a freshman coming in. Like Bam Sill was like a top sixty recruit, right? Yeah. And like what we talked about earlier, it's such a complicated system with all the different options based on how the defense plays you. It takes a while to to learn that, and for everybody to be able to execute it efficiently. So, I mean, I, I think Mike Young 
is going to recruit well to his system. It may or may not match up people's expectations in, in the rankings. I know this, the most highly ranked class Virginia Tech ever, has ever signed was that 2011 class that ranked like 10th or 11th in the country by ESPN. And that class, Finney Smith's in the NBA, but the rest of that class was a complete bust. Uh, Marquise Rankin, Robert Brown, uh, Brown had a decent career at UAB, but uh, C.J. Barksdale, Van Zegeren, that was a five-man class. One player for every position, point guard, shooting guard, small yeah. forward, power forward, center. But it wasn't a bought-in class, and it was an overhyped class. And uh, I don't know. I just like what we're doing now better. I'm not not, not so concerned about the rankings. or. Yeah, I, I don't know that Tech could land one or some of those guys. I'm not sure they're even going to pursue them. In order for them to be able to land them, they're going to have to win a lot of ball games over yeah. the next five years or so. But even right. then, I just don't think – Mike Young's no spring chicken. He's a year older than me. I mean, he, he knows who he is and as a yeah, coach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Villanova won it without one and duns. UVA won it without one and duns. They had some early entrants, <clears throat> but they weren't one and duns. And there, there's a big difference. So yeah. I, I just don't – I don't I just don't know that a one and done would be beneficial to to Virginia Tech basketball right now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Eric Fisher: Is Beatty the most underappreciated by fans basketball player in Virginia Tech history? Oh, man. And I'll, I'll while you guys think on this for a minute, let me let me take it from a younger perspective who has only about ten years worth of a sample size, and really, the end of the James Johnson era to now is kind of my sample size. Hmm. I think from that point forward. For those that are in college, yes. To me, it surprises me how much flack Beatty gets. To me, I don't know. I watched the first three games. I saw a much more confident Wabisa Beatty with the ball. Like when he had the ball, knowing what to do. Like when he fouled out of that Villanova game, to me, like I could feel like a letdown. Like, oh gosh, like Beatty fouled out. Like, right. you know, the, the confidence they have when he's on the floor. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't score much, but to me, he's just the classic example of someone who does so much that doesn't show up in the stat sheet. Uh, well, night I'm night. gonna I'm gonna beat that into people's heads throughout the course of the season. Every time he goes out and doesn't have a, did he score that last night? I don't think he scored last night. He, he did not score, did not but score. Really? Yeah. he had two steals, he had three assists, he had one rebound, right, and he played 25 well, well, minutes, right, 25 <laughs> minutes, and wow. didn't score, right, wow. so. Tech fans look at the box score and see he didn't make any shots. They're always oh, terrible. Take him off, right? Well, I'm going to beat that into people's heads. Every scoreless game he has this year uh, about buy-in and how, like, the reason Hunter Couture and a lot of, and Naheem Aline and Jalen Cohn and guys like that, the reason they're so bought in and, and the reason they've developed as players is because the guy they had to look up to when they enrolled was doing everything right off the court. And when I see Wabi Sabidi walk into Kroger with two or three other players like like Couture and Aline, and they walk in and Beatty's in front and the other guys are behind him. There's nobody standing shoulder to shoulder or in front of Beatty. They're all behind him, man. And uh, he does all so many things for this program that a box score could not possibly explain. And I, you take things like that for granted until this football season happens. Yeah. Right. And I think it's really I think this football season will actually has made me appreciate BD even more than I already did, because I see what they lack in the football program over there. And he brings all that in large numbers to the basketball program. And and so, yeah, when when Mike Young got here and, you know, there were two guys in the portal. Right. It was Nolly and BD. And he retained both of them for that year. And everybody's like, oh, retaining Nolly's huge. And. Yeah, yeah, B retaining BD. Yeah, B <laughs> BD's a guy, okay, yeah, he'll probably start because we don't know everybody else, but blah, blah, but, you know, but Nolly's the most important guy. No, not even All close. Right. Yeah. Uh, so underappreciated guys in the past. Uh, old school, old schoolers will remember uh, oh, yeah. Al Young. Al Young was a point guard who never looked to score. He was a terrible shooter, but he could really run. They were called the um, the Hurry and Hokies back then, and he could really run that offense. He's a phenomenal athlete and, and Good dribbler and great defender. But most people appreciate Al Young. The next one I can think about is Jamon Gordon. Most people appreciate and like Jamon Gordon, but I don't think they truly comprehend how good that guy they was. They probably don't grasp, like, he was ACC Defensive Player of the Year. 
You know how and a great rebounder. Right, right, yeah. And a pretty good scorer. And a guy who could play the point. I mean, he was phenomenal. He was kind of like Tyrese Radford to a certain extent. Yeah. Except better, probably a better defender than, than Radford. Well, definitely mm. a better defender. Yeah, and not, a, that, not that Radford's a bad defender. Yeah. It's just Jamon was elite. My answer would be Marcus Sales. Um, I think that's yeah, that's solid. Uh, Marcus Sales was a key player on that Seth Greenberg NCAA tournament team. Uh, rarely started, but came off the bench, played a decent amount. Sales was six five, and he could play. He could guard three positions, three different positions, and he could really handle the ball, and was really good defender. Could get a lot of steals. I mean, that that whole team was a was a group of guys that got a lot of steals. So when him and Jamon Gordon and Zabian and Dowdell were on the court together. That was the best defensive backcourt Virginia Tech's ever had when that trio of players was was on the court together. For a defensive-minded coach. For a defensive-minded coach, right, exactly. So uh, I Marcus Sales was like Beatty. He had – Beatty was a more – is honestly a more advanced offensive player than Marcus Sales was. Hmm. Um, but for for what he did for that team, I mean, he was a, he was a, the right fit for that team. Um, so I, and I, I don't think he's a guy that most tech fans even remember even existed. So you can also include on your ballot Paul Debnam. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave that there. All right, quick answer for this one uh, from NCVT Hokey. With so much apparent depth on the team through three games, how do how do we keep everyone happy with playing time, especially with Ojiako and Cone coming back? Also, will lack of PT lead to transfers? Well, I mean, I, these I, were. I think that you win. And you work on the culture. Yeah. Um, and these conversations are, are are had before the season, or at least they should be. Like uh, like when Cordell Pimsel decides to transfer to Virginia Tech, you know, Mike, that's the conversation he has with Mike Young, right? Is, uh, okay, how do you see my playing time going in my one year that I'm going to be available to play there? And, and, and you tell him. And you're honest with them. As long as you're honest with everybody, it's up to them. Like, if, if everybody, like, if you told Pencil before the season, all right, you're going to play a lot against South Florida, but maybe not so much against Villanova, you know, dep- or whatever, Those kind depending of on the matchups, that he goes into the season expecting things to go a certain way. And so far, it's going that way, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I just, yes, there's always going to be attrition. But as long as you're upfront and honest with everybody, and they buy into that before they sign, and they don't, and they come in and they're not presented with a bunch of situations that they weren't expecting, then I think it'll be okay. Okay, um, let's go with. Uh, let's see here. We do have a couple of questions in here about basketball, but we do have two about football. Let's go rapid fire. This one, Billy Parvidum asks: Tech has a number of NFL alumni: D'Angelo Hall, Brandon Flowers, Shane Graham, etc. Why can't Tech get them to coach here? Is it money? Are they not interested? Does Witt not like hiring alums? Uh, uh, so I, I have a thought on that. Um, I, I still can't believe Daryl Tapp is here. What does Tapp make? Two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand a year? Probably not quite that much. He played. He played a lot of years in the NFL, right? You know, he's set. That assistant coaching is a really hard job because you have to recruit. You have to work your butt off. The guys that that just got listed made a lot of money in the NFL. Uh, well, what's the question? Why can't you get him to come here and coach? How many of them actually want to coach? They they'll say it on Twitter. Don't be fooled by that. Yeah, yeah, and like and, Antonio Freeman said, and they've never coached before. Like, I, I, and some of these guys are like there are peak parts of the season where the guys are working sixteen hour days. I'm sorry if you've got if you're a multi millionaire like Antonio Freeman is, why do you want to work sixteen hours a day? When I, I retire mean, from TSL, I'm not going to continue working seven days right. a week at some other yeah, job that uh, pays less. There, there, there's a reason that, that if you look around the country at almost everybody's staff, less Daryl Tapp is the outlier. Guys that were the greatest players and went to the NFL and things like that, they don't get into coaching because they're set. And a lot right. of those guys were such naturally gifted players anyway that maybe the mental sides of the game, like they, they didn't have to be as strong that way. So the, um, so the answer to that is Dre Bly. How many years did Dre Bly play? In the NFL? He's he's uh, he played a lot. Um, so he's also an he's outlier. also a, a, an outlier. He and Daryl Tapper are, are, are the outliers. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, it's your uh, it's your Justin Hamiltons. Yeah, it's it's your Cody Grimm's. Good players who sniff the NFL, right? But and who were mentally strong, but did yeah. not make a ton of money in the NFL. And quite frankly, you know, you don't want to hire coach players unless they're qualified or. You know, like 
oh, like D'Angelo Hall was a great player for Tech, but he's never coached football a day in his life, right? Like, how could if if you loaded down the Virginia Tech staff with all former players, what would you get? That 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 wouldn't be a good thing. What, what would you get? Like, so, I, I I'm in favor of of the right mix and everything, but but you just can't hire a bunch of dudes just because they happen to play in yeah. Virginia. So this Tech. was supposed to be rapid fire. Sorry, that's Sorry. right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last one on football and. Jacob asks, I'll, I'm going to turn your question. I'll ask your, answer your question, Jacob. I'll ask another one, too. Assuming we are one of the teams with a losing record chosen for a bowl, who do you all think we will face? Let me answer the first part and say a lot of bowls. We just saw the pinstripe bowl came out and said that they're not going to have a bowl until 2021. We're seeing well, a lot of bowls York. come out right now. So don't we won't know the opponent until the bowl selection We don't out. even know how many of these bowls will actually happen. And we don't even know, like – how many teams like they're actually going to go? Because I mean, do we know that like the the ACC is going to cover travel costs to bowls this year like they normally do? Right, right. Like like we don't know that. Um, I, I know if Tech goes to a bowl, like I somehow uh, I, everybody criticizes John Swafford for his TV deal. So I think this biggest failure has been lack of a tie in with the Bahamas bowl. If you're going to have a bad year in football, have a bad year and go to the Bahamas bowl, right? Not the, not the pinstripe bowl, <laughs> not the pinstripe bowl yeah, that's, or, uh, or yeah, go somewhere where it's warm. So that, that is basically the unanswerable question at this yeah, point. So I, yeah. I don't know. And even not many writers are toying around with that. They, they kind of usually do at this time of year, but I haven't seen a whole lot of nope. bowl project bowl projections. All right. Uh, final note. NCVT Hokey writes back and says, Al Young was such a great athlete that he was drafted by the New York Giants as a defensive back. Yeah. So I always tell that story. I believe he was drafted in the 12th round back when they had 12 mm -hmm. rounds and he was cut fairly quickly. And, and if, if I remember correctly, the, the reason was, trust me, Al Young was plenty quick enough, but he wasn't fast enough. He was with a basketball, but apparently he could not like stay with an NFL receiver 20, 30, 40 yards downfield. And I think that was the reason that he was cut because he was certainly beefy enough and athletic enough and quick enough. Michael Vick was drafted in the 30th round by the Colorado, Colorado Rockies. Rockies. That's right. That's right. All right. Hour and 20 minutes into the podcast. Wow, just really? about to, Yeah, it was a quick hour 20, wasn't it? Yeah. Someone did comment, by the way. It was Brian Woodward. I'm impressed you guys have spent an hour on three games so far. There should be a fine every time somebody mentions tournament in November. LOL. <laughs> Tournament sure. talk is always fun, though, Brian. Come on. This is what oh, we're supposed to do. You're the one who do. started it, too. I did. I, well, I would have asked the question if we did a preseason podcast. So it just adds a little bit more when you beat the number three team in the country. So anyways. Um, all right. That'll just about do it for us, Chris Coleman. It's crossover season. Yeah. Uh, I see that event calendar over there right now. What's coming up on TSL? I don't think I've week? got anything written on it yet. So <laughs> I don't know. We will do an Inside the Numbers this week. We'll have normal football interviews today. Tech Talk Live notes tomorrow. I think Brandon Patterson's going to send an article. I, I don't know if point. you're going to get a Monday article from me today or not um, because of the two basketball games and me being lazy because it was Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. And now what I mean by that is ordinarily I work on my Monday article on Sunday nights, but there was a game. Last and night. for anybody expecting some kind of big football article from us saying, Oh, here's what needs to happen. Here's what we think is going to happen. Like that's not going to happen because all the evidence isn't in. And like, at this point, the, the all, we know what the fan base thinks. You know, you just have to sit back and await events at this point, right? So I was thinking about that, and here's here's the way I look at that, that, there, that there's a lot of people that want to change at the coaching position. And once you come to that as a fan, you want it to happen right away. Mm -hmm. That's just not how it works. Um, and I don't mean to imply that it's going to happen or anything like that. Just because you're there as an individual fan and, and you're like, I don't want that guy coaching my team anymore. And, and there's a lot of people out there at this point in time. There, now, I will say that in my last subscriber article, I put in there, remember, this was right after the loss to Pitt, 47 to 14. I basically put a poll in that, that said, you know, I had four options. One of them was, I think Fuente will be let go, you know, at the latest by the end of the year. Um, I think he should get another year before I make up my mind. And, and it was like as many as 25% fell into the category of, I think he'll be successful here or he needs more time. It's not the, the rampaging torches and, and, and pitchforks that you're seeing on Twitter. You ran the exact same poll after the pit game in 2015 with Frank Beamer. And 
Or the Wake for, Wake Forest game, I think, in 2014. It was the Wake Forest game in 2014. Okay. Uh, and, okay, right. At any rate, Fuente actually had more support. Than Frank did after the Wake Forest game in 2014. Right, which is hard to fathom now, I know, right. with, with, the, with, with the way things tr- read on Twitter. But you also have to consider the like, coaching staff, head coaching changes. It's more than just about the AD making the decision. Like at Virginia Tech... You know, it's a BOV thing. The BOV too. is going to be and, involved, and, and it's much, much different in the South, man, where the BOV just caves to for football at every school, and that's not the case at, at schools like. And again, I read Tech. an interesting comment that South Carolina's president Bob Caslin was the the guy who decided to pull the plug on Muschamp. Right, it, Tim it, Sands is not going to. Well, do that. yeah, and that's how it is in the SEC. Is like the school president steps in and tells the athletic director, "If you don't fire the football coach, you're fired." Right, <laughs> and and, and, the, and the fans are so hardcore down there that they tell the school president, well, if you don't fire the AD and get him For to not fire, the, the football then you're coach, fired. Then you you're know? fired. <laughs> Somebody's getting fired right, down there, no matter what. <laughs> but but uh, it's not like that at Virginia Tech. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will have a podcast on Thursday at 1 o'clock. Hope you can join us on YouTube Live for primetime college football, 7.30 kick on ABC, Virginia Tech, and Clemson. We will preview that game on Thursday, and, of course, we'll have football content and men's basketball content. Couldn't couldn't buy a night game for years. Uh, now no. when we don't want one. Just, well, <laughs> just, well anyways, gosh, we, 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 we will have the game previewed. All right, uh, gentlemen, uh, before we wrap up, any final thoughts? Uh. None whatsoever other than I'm I'm very cautiously optimistic about this basketball team. Okay. But, right. you know, Villanova had played three games in four days, and USF is poorly coached. Yep. You you heard the announcer on ESPN, too, John Christmas. talking about how they, they weren't communicating. They look bad on offense. They look bad on defense. Also on the podcast Thursday, Hokies will play VMI on Thursday night. We'll briefly talk about that on Thursday. 8 o'clock ACC Network. That'll do it for us. Episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast in the books for our managing editor, Chris Coleman, our founder and general manager, Will Stewart, the best podcast producer in the land. To my right, Malcolm Stewart. I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes, saying so long. Thanks so much for watching and listening to episode 154 of the Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. Have a great week, Hokies, and we'll talk to you Thursday. (laughs) 